Okay. Uh, good early uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very happy to begin this uh, session. Uh, beforehand, I would like to apologize to the speakers uh, that I wasn't able to um, listen to the uh, to be present here uh, for personal reasons. But I'm very much looking forward to reading uh, the published articles, uh, inshallah. Um, so we begin with uh, Professor Livnat Holtzman, uh, Associate Professor uh, in the Department of Arabic at Barilan University. Uh, she specializes in Islamic theology and Hadith studies. Uh, she has published extensively on the theological thought of uh, 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 Hanbali scholars uh, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim al jawziyah uh, her recent monograph in 2000, from 2018, entitled uh, Anthropomorphism in Islam, the Challenge of Traditionalism, 700 to 350, uh, from what I've been told uh, just now, is being translated also into Arabic and should be uh, published uh, uh, in Dar al Rawafid in uh, Beirut. Um, this uh, monograph, Anthropomorphism in Islam, offers a wide-scale analysis of the textual and non-textual elements of Ahadith al-Sifat, that is, the traditions that depict God in an anthropomorphic uh, language. Um, and I understand we will be hearing about that uh, also uh, today. Um, currently, Professor Holtzman um, a, a research, research um, uh, focuses on the Prophet's gestures in Islamic thought, um, a project that is also financed uh, by the Israel uh, Science Foundation. And it aims to present a systematic and conceptualized discussion of the significant place of the Prophet's physical gestures uh, in Islamic theological discourse between the 7th and the 16th uh, centuries. Um, um, and this project, attempt, this project attempts to recount the history of gestures in Islamic thought and define them as meaningful components uh, in political theological discourse. So, please. So, thank you and um, good afternoon. And... Uh, well, I'm also very grateful um, for uh, to. I'm grateful that um, Professor Friedman and Professor Orlando Tasseron invited me to speak to you today. And <clears throat> well, you have a, a handout. I apologize that I did not um, um, circulate any draft of this talk because uh, the things that I'm going to uh, show today are really. They are a bit premature, but, uh, and also I w uh, await your uh, response and uh, remarks. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the events of the turbulent Hijri year 317, that's 929 uh, common era, was a riot, fitna, that erupted in Baghdad between the Hanbalis and an unspecified Sunni group. In his Al Kamil fi Tariq, the historian Ibn al Athir inserts a short and laconic entry about this riot. This entry was duplicated by the Damsin historian Ibn Kathir in his Al Bidaya wa Nihaya. Like other authors from the Mamluk period, the added value of Ibn Kathir's historical writing lies in his insights on the original text of his predecessors. So let us read what Ibn Kathir writes about this riot. So according to Ibn Kathir, you have it here um, um, on screen. In that year, the Hanbalis had an argument with other uneducated Sunnis, Al-Amma, about the interpretation of the Quranic verse, Asan yabathaka rabbuka maqaman mahmuda. Your Lord may exalt you to an honorable station, maqam mahmud. So the Hanbali said that the honorable station meant that God would sit him, Muhammad, next to him, next to God, on the divine throne. The other said, this verse describes the formidable event of intercession, al-Shafa'a al-Kubra. Ibn Kathir remarks, the discussion over this matter soon deteriorated into a fight in which people were killed. Verily to God we belong and to him we will return. 
So this is the original text by uh, Ibn Kathir. And we would have expected that Ibn Kathir, who was a Hanbali and an indirect disciple of Ibn Qayyim al jawziya supported the Hanbali interpretation of Maqam Mahmud with its obvious anthropomorphic and corporalistic implications on the perception of the Godhead. However, Ibn Kathir chose to side the rivals, as we see from his ruling in the matter. Ibn Kathir says, and you see it here uh, on screen, and I read it in English, it is established in Sahih al-Bukhari that Maqam Mahmud means the station of the formidable intercession, Maqam Shafa al-Kubra, in which the Prophet will intercede when God arrives to render judgment about his servants. This is the station in which all human beings from the first to the last generation, including Abraham, the friend of God, will request Muhammad's intercession and be rejoiced by it. So Ibn Kathir directs his readers to the consensual interpretation of Maqam Mahmud. This interpretation stems from the hadith, hadith which is called Hadith al-Shafa'a, which is attributed to the Sahabi Ibn Abbas and other companions of the Prophet. Indeed, the dozens of versions of Hadith al-Shafa'a, which were massively transmitted and taught for generations, are recorded in canonical and non-canonical Hadith compilations, including the Musnad of Ahmad ibn Hanbal. In his interpretation of Maqam Mahmud, Muhammad ibn Jarir al-Tabari quotes 22 versions of Hadith al-Shafa'a. These hadith are roughly divided in two groups. The first group presents an elaborate narrative which describes three scenes in detail. The gathering of the resurrected, the hardships they encounter in their way to the place of judgment, and Muhammad's capacity as an intercessor. The second group presents a brief dictum which states that Maqam Mahmud is the intercession. An example to the brief dictum is the following version which is attributed to Ibn Abbas after Ibn Abbas recited Asan Yabathaka Rabbuka Maqam al Mahmuda, he explained to his disciples Al Maqam al Mahmud, Maqam Shafa. By choosing to interpret Maqam Mahmud as Shafa, Ibn Kathir placed himself with the majority of Ahl al Hadith wal Jama'ah, Ahl al Sunnah wal Jama'ah, and against the Hanbalis. Elsewhere in Al Bidaya wa Nihaya, Ibn Kathir provides a well reasoned explanation for his preference of the view of the majority and his rejection of the Hanbali interpretation of Maqam Mahmud. Ibn Kathir's view was not as extraordinary as we might think. Indeed, the Hanbalis as a group vehemently promoted the idea that Muhammad would sit on the divine throne next to God. Apart from the riot of 317, the sources record another grave incident which is connected to the interpretation of Maqam Mahmud. I refer, of course, to the persecution of At-Tabari by the Hanbalis and the events that led to his shameful death in 310. That's 923. Still, there were Hanbalis like Ibn Kathir who abhorred this concept and rationalized its rejection. The Hanbalis of Baghdad drew their interpretation of the Quranic Maqam Mahmud from Hadith al-Julus ala al-Arsh, the Hadith about the sitting on the throne, henceforth Hadith al-Julus. In Hadith criticism, Hadith al-Julus is categorized as Khabar al-Wahid, namely a Hadith transmitted by one individual narrator. The individual narrator in this case is Mujahid ibn Jabr, the Quran exegete from Mecca, who was one of the prominent disciples of Ibn Abbas. According to Hadith al-Julus, after Mujahid recited, Asan yab'athuka, yab'athaka rabbuka maqam al-Mahmuda, qala yujlisuhu ala al-arsh. And God will sit him, Muhammad, on the throne. Mujahid's interpretation of Hadith al-Julus was considered exclusive and unique by generations of scholars, so much so that it was dubbed Hadith Mujahid. We find the earliest reference to this term in Kitab al-Sunnah of the 10th century Hanbali scholar Abu Bakr al-Khalal. This compilation of sayings of Hanbalis of the first and second generations presents a quotation of Ahmad ibn Hanbal himself, who said, quote, whoever rejects Hadith Mujahid is a Jahmi, 
unquote, a Jahami, a de derogative name for the Mu'tazilis. So this saying clarifies that the street fights between the Hanbalis and their rivals were not merely over the interpretation of Maqam Mahmud, but over the status of Hadith al-Julus or Hadith Mujahid. <clears throat> the 10th century riot in Baghdad and Ibn Kathir's aversion to the Hanbali stance are only fragments of a larger story which I toiled to reconstruct in recent years. The story of the canonization of Hadith al-Julus from its inception in the study circle of Mujahid in 8th century Mecca until the later Mamluk period and probably beyond. Parts of this story were already revealed by Martin Schreiner, Friedrich Kern, and Thor André. Ignaz Goldziher provided intuitive and remarkably accurate insights on the transformation of Hadith al-Julus or Mujahid's interpretation of Quran 1779 from a dictum taught by a Meccan Quran exegete to an article of faith. Josef van Es addressed several aspects of this story. However, an overall analysis of Hadith al-Julus and the process of its canonization, which ultimately failed, is still a desideratum. In my monograph on anthropomorphism, I established that the process of canonization of Hadith al-Julus did not start with Ahmad ibn Hanbal and his son Abdullah, although Hanbali sources claimed that both Ahmad and Abdullah vouched for the veracity and authenticity of this Hadith. It was the great canonizer of Ahmad ibn Hanbal's teachings, Ahmad ibn Muhammad Abu Bakr al-Marwazi, or al-Marwazi, who was responsible for the transformation of Hadith al-Julus from a marginal Hadith to an iconic text. Al-Marwazi and his fellow Hanbalis started a massive process of proliferating this text, a process which is recorded in detail in al-Khalal's Kitab al-Sunnah. Among other things, Hanbalis were required to accept this hadith as part of their creed and to publicly profess their faith in this text. Indeed, the first two decades of the 4th or 10th century were characterized by rigorous efforts of Hanbali muhaddithun to establish the status of hadith mujahid, or rather the creedal concept that was extorted from this text as an icon of Hanbalism. The concept, was rather straightforward, as all Hanbali concepts are. That Muhammad sitting on the throne next to God is a fadila, one of the no noble fadail virtues that were attributed to Muhammad. As Abu Bakr al-Najjad, one of the prominent Hanbali muhaddithun of Baghdad said, we will adhere to this conviction until the day we die. Hmm. So in the time that remains for this talk, where is my, Michael? Don't cut me, okay? <laughs> okay, in the time that remains for this talk, I will focus on one episode in the saga of Hadith al-Julus. The story of the well-known Hanbali scholar Muhammad ibn Hussein ibn al-Fara', who is mostly known as the Qadi Abu Ya'la, and his strenuous efforts to boost the prestige of Hadith al-Julus. Abu Ya'la composed a scandalous book which was supposed to defend the Hanbali creed. This book, Ibtal al-Ta'wilat al sifat contains a large section about Maqam Mahmud, which reflects comprehensive and systematic attempts to sacralize Hadith al-Julus. Ibtal al-Ta'wilat is an important milestone in the development of the Hanbali creed, yet it still awaits a thorough analysis. The findings that I will present here are preliminary and need further processing. First, I will present Ibtal Tawilat. Then I will briefly address Abu Ya'la's discussion of Hadith al-Julus, which is unparalleled in the traditionalistic discourse and even among the Hanbalis. Finally, I will consider the opposition to this book, which is reflected in Ibn Kathir's discussion of Maqam Mahmud. In 429, that's 1037-38, Abu Ya'la, a former rationalist who repented and became an ultra-traditionalist, published his controversial Ibtal al-Ta'wilat li-akhbar al-Sifat, which means invalidating the metaphorical interpretation of the anthropomorphic hadith or the hadith about the attributes of God. As its 
title indicates, the book is a compilation of a hadith sifat, the traditions that either depicted God in an anthropomorphic language or attributed corporality and speciality to God. The book is also a refutation of the Ash'ari practice of ta'wil, namely applying metaphorical or figurative interpretation on a hadith sifat. Ibtala ta'wilat was considered lost for centuries until the Kuwaiti scholar Muhammad al Hamud al Najdi received a handmade copy of what was claimed to be the complete manuscript of the book. This copy was prepared in the beginning of the 20th century by a Wahhabist copyist. The copy is preserved in the library of Dar al Ifta in Saudi, while the original manuscript was never retrieved. And Najdi published a reliable edition of Ibtalita Wilat, which sadly presents only two thirds of the manuscript. You see it on screen uh, in the um, icon above. This is the um, a cover of uh, a Najdi's edition. A supposedly complete edition of the book, this is the icon uh, below, uh, was prepared in 2009 by Muhammad Uthman. This edition is based on another copy of the manuscript, which was preserved in the library of the National Museum of Iraq in Baghdad. However, as far as my investigation went, crucial material that appears in the Saudi manuscript, which is available online in the Aluka website, was omitted from the 2009 publication, while material from other sources was unjustifiably added to this edition. The outcome is an inferior, uh, unreliable edition of Ibtal et Tawilat. Okay, <clears throat> so Ibtal et Tawilat is one link in a chain of books that stirred much commotion among the traditionalists of Iraq and Khurasan. The first book in this lineage was Ibn Khuzaymah's Kitab et Tawhid. This book was the first comprehensive collection of Hadith al-Sifat, and it forthrightly encouraged a literal reading of these problematic texts. Kitab al-Tawheed rapidly gained popularity among the Muhaddithun and maintained its lucrative position in the ultra-traditionalistic communities for centuries. At least two refutations of Kitab al-Tawheed were written, one by the prominent Ash'ari scholar Ibn Furak, this is uh, Mushkil al-Hadith or uh, Ta'wil al-Akhbar al mutashabiha And the other refutation was written by Fakhradin Razi. This is the book As Asas et Taqdis. So uh, Abu Yala wrote uh, his book as a systematic response to Ibn Furak's Mushkil al-Hadith. In the introduction of Ibtal Tawilat, Abu Yala testified that he composed his book at the request of his disciples who were concerned by Ibn Furak's figurative reading of the anthropomorphic hadith material. The last link in, the, in this genealogy is Ibn al-Jawzi's Kitab Akhbar al-Sifat, which is a systematic and severe refutation of Ibtal Tawilat. Ibn al-Jawzi was a Hanbali. Indeed, apart from one case, all the refutations of Ibtal Tawilat stemmed from the Hanbali school. The basic idea of Ibtal Tawilat is that upholding a firm and unshaken belief in the content of Hadith Sifat is the emblem of the genuine Islamic faith. According to Abu Ya'la, the Hanbalis are the custodians of this true faith, whereas the Asharis, the upholders, uh, upholders of Tawil, stray away from the true uh, faith. So basically, the book was designed to encourage its readers to take pride in the rare versions of Hadith al-Sifat that the Hanbalis cherished, while the others, uh, other muhaddithun rejected on technical grounds. Abu Ya'la gradually builds the Hanbali pride by quoting a massive number of sayings attributed to the generations that preceded Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Thus, the Baghdadi Muhaddith Abu Ma'mar al-Hudali, a contemporary of Ahmad ibn Hanbal, is quoted as saying, uh, is saying what? Man za'ma anna Allah ta'ala la yatakallamu wa la yabsuru wa la yasma'u wa la ya'jabu wa la yathaku wa la yaghdabu. And here, uh, Abu Ma'mar quoted several hadith sifat wa dhakara hadith sifat فهو كافر بالله ومن رأيتموه على بئر وهو واقف أو أو واقفا فألقوه فيها. 
So what he said is that um, whoever claims that God does not speak, see, and hear, whoever claims that God is not pleased, does not laugh, and is not angry, and here Abu Mamar quotes a number of hadith sifat, some of them, then he does not believe in God if you see such a person standing near a well, throw him inside. Yazid ibn Harun, one of Ahmad ibn Hanbal's teachers, said, uh, who disbelieves in a hadith sifat has nothing to do with God and God has nothing to do with him. So throughout Ibtal Ta'wilat, Abu Ya'la assumes two different approaches to the topic of hadith sifat. The first approach is hermeneutical and theological. Abu Ya'la encourages his readers to understand the anthropomorphic texts literally. Hamluha ala zahiriha. So he says, and in the, uh, you see it in the quotation here, whoever reads an expression literally, man hamla laftha ala zahirihi, reads it in its proper and actual meaning. Whoever applies a figurative interpretation on an expression de deviates to the realm of metaphor. It is impossible to add a metaphor to the attributes of God. So there are more than 70 examples of this literal reading in Ibtal Ta'wilat. For example, Abu Ya'la quotes a tradition in which the Prophet testified that God placed the palm of his hand, hand between the Prophet's shoulders. And the Prophet um, uh, testifies, فَوَجَدْتُ بَرْدَهَا بَيْنَ ثَدَّيَّ And I felt its coldness between my breasts. Abu Ya'la remarks, reading this tradition literally is neither absurd regarding his attributes, nor does it exceed the appropriate discourse on him, on God. We affirm the existence of a divine palm of hand as we affirm the two divine hands, ears, eyes, and face. From this short passage, we learn that Abu Ya'la is willing to accept any description of God uh, in Ahadith al-Sifat as a divine attribute. By doing so, he expands the list of the attributes, uh, the divine attributes, to dozens. His approach faithfully echoes the Hanbali approach to the number of the divine attributes, whereas the Asharis affirmed only eight divine attributes of essence, power, knowledge, life, will, hearing, sight, speech, and enduringness, and several anthropomorphic attributes that are mentioned in the Quran, like face, eyes, hand. The Hanbalis had longer lists of attributes, anthropomorphic and anthropopathic, which were extracted from the Hadith. The extremely long lists of attributes were one of the hallmarks of the ultra-traditionalists. Let us now examine Abu Ya'la's approach to Maqam Mahmud, Hadith Mujahid, and Muhammad sitting on a throne. First, Abu Ya'la willingly explains what is the meaning of the sitting on the throne. This willingness distances Abu Ya'la from the traditionalistic Bila Kaifa formula. The Bila Kaifa formula in its traditionalistic version means accepting the anthropomorphic descriptions at face value without questioning their content. When reading the description of Muhammad sitting on the throne, Abu Ya'la directs us to read the text literally and states, where does he state it? Yes, he will sit him on his throne and couch, Sarir, which means that he will bring him close to his essence. He further explains, reading this tradition literally is not absurd regarding his attributes because we do not say that he is in a specific direction, but we express um, this attribute as is permissible to describe him. And that is that he is on the throne and not in a specific direction. It is also possible that he draws near with some of his essence and not in a specific direction. This event, this is evident from the verse, and here he quotes uh, uh, the verse, then drawing near, he came down within two bows length or even closer. <clears throat> I said that uh, Abu Ya'la takes two approaches, and now we will see the second approach. Uh, the second approach is even more interesting, but because here Abu Ya'la expands the collection of the relevant hadith on the sitting on the throne to 29 texts. 
um, as, as I said before, Atabari quotes only one version, and here Abu Yala has 29 versions. His collection includes three rare texts that attribute the interpretation of Maqam Mahmud as Muhammad sitting on the throne, not to Mujahid, who was a tabi'i, but to his master, Ibn Abbas, who was a sahabi. These texts are not found in any earlier source, and they were probably fabricated and circulated to satisfy the need to boost the prestige of Mujahid saying. The inspiration to such a maneuver is an anecdote attributed to one of Ahmad ibn Hanbal's disciples. This disciple claimed that when Ahmad read Hadith Mujahid, he said, Mujahid was not the only one to transmit this text. Ibn Abbas was the first to transmit it. And then Ahmad wrote with his hand several chains of transmission to this text. Uh, this anecdote appears in Kitab al-Sunnah of uh, Al-Khalal. While Ahmad was satisfied with recording one text that goes back to Ibn Abbas, Abu Ya'la managed to retrieve several texts that go back to prominent Sahaba like Abdullah ibn Umar, Aisha, and Anas ibn Malik. Some of these texts quote the Prophet saying that he would sit next to God on the throne or the couch, hence they are considered as marfu. None of these texts is quoted elsewhere, and needless to say, they are dubious. Abu Ya'la's source for this text, you see here, Haddathanahu uh, Abu Al-Qasim, uh, is a, Han a marginal Hanbali scholar by the name of uh, Abdul Aziz ibn Ali Abu Qasim al Khayyat. We learn from the chain of transmission that these texts circulated only among Hanbalis, who, as I proved uh, elsewhere, were more receptive to a hadith of dubious origin than scholars from other schools. Abu Yala's book was a cause of embarrassment to his fellow Hanbalis as it fell to the hands of their rivals, the Asharis, like a ripe plum. His book proved exactly what the rivals of the Hanbalis claimed, that the Hanbalis were anthropomorphists, mushabbiha. Accordingly, Ibtal al-Tawilat was described as al-Maqala fi tashbih the treatise on anthropomorphism. When the book started circulating in Baghdad, one of the young leaders of the Hanbalis, Abu Muhammad ibn Tamimi um, said, Abu Ya'la, I, I read it in Arabic, okay? لَقَدْ خَرِّيَ أَبُوْ يَعْلَى الْفَرَعَلَى الْحَنَابِلَةِ خِرْيَةً لَيَغْسِلُهَا الْمَاءِ I didn't write it. <laughs> so I, I say it in English. I, I hope that in English it is more, you know, appropriate. Uh, I looked it in the dictionary. <laughs> Abu Ya'la defecated on us Hanbalis to such a degree that water will never wash his exurement away. Variants of this juicy anecdote are found in the works of the later historians Ibn Asakir, Sipti ibn al jawzi and al-Safadi. So according to these scholars, when the news of Abu Ya'la's death arrived at Ibn Tamimi's ears, he cursed Abu Ya'la but instead of accusing Abu Ya'la of defecating on the Hanabila, he accused him of urinating on them. So in the long run, Abu Ya'la's extraordinary effort to sacralize Hadith al-Julus failed. A representative text for this failure is Ibn Kathir's treatment of this Hadith. In the closing part of Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya, which is dedicated to eschatology, even Kathir, whom I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, expressed a skeptic view towards Hadith al-Julus. Ibn Kathir does not reject Hadith al-Julus forthrightly. However, he provides the necessary reason for rejecting this text. And I quote, one should not accept a text like this unless it is attributed to the Prophet himself. Indeed, there is no other Hadith which supports this Hadith al-Julus. The saying which is attributed to Mujahid and others cannot in itself serve as a proof. Ibn Kathir adds that a similar text which was attributed to the Sahabi Abdullah ibn Salam, a Jew who converted to Islam, had an inauthentic isnad, lam yasiha isnaduhu. So Ibn Kathir dared not label this text as fabricated. He merely pointed out that a group of Ahl al jamaa accepted this hadith, and God knows best what is right. Um, I come to the conclusion. Ibtal Tawilat presented an exceptional approach to a Hadith al-Sifat even among the Hanbali scholars. 
The stir that it made <clears throat> among the intellectual elite could have easily diffused throughout the streets of Baghdad and deteriorate into riot. The Caliph Al-Qaim Billah decided to intervene and restore uh, order in the Sunni community. He organized the ceremony in which the disputing parties signed a new version of the Qadiri Creed. Indeed, the publication of Abtalit Awilat was the direct cause of the reissuance of the Qadiri Creed, but this is a matter for another discussion. Ibtalita Awilat was harshly criticized by Hanbali and other traditionalistic scholars. The Hanbali historian and theologian Ibn al Jawzi gained access to the book and systematically refuted it in his Kitab Akhbar al Sifat. According to Ibn al Jawzi, three scholars, among them was Abu Ya'la, were responsible for the penetration of anthropomorphic conceptions of God to the Hanbali community. The Damascene scholars Shams al Din al Dhahabi and Ibn Taymiyyah quoted passages from the book. However, it is possible that these two later scholars merely relied on Ibn al-Jawzi's Kitab Akhbar al-Sifat. Both Hanbali scholars argued that Abu Ya'la's insufficient knowledge of hadith and inconsistent approach towards the anthropomorphic hadith led to a disastrous outcome for the Hanbalis. A Dhahabi further argued that Abu Ya'la had poor knowledge of um, Ilm al-Rijal, which was essential for the process of, authentic of authenticating or invalidating hadith material. Abu Ya'la's inadequate education in hadith led him to include fabricated material in Ibtal Etawilat. The criticism of the incredible content of Ibtal Etawilat on the one hand, and the limited circulation of the book, and here we see the ijaza of the book, um, and uh, from the ijaza we see that the book was copied by uh, Wahhabi scholars um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the end of the 19th century. So there, there is a really huge gap between the bo book uh, circulating in Baghdad or circulated for a short time in Baghdad, arriving to Damascus, and then there is a gap of 300 years, or even more, more than 300 years, uh, before it appears again in Saudi Arabia. So, I, or Wahhabi uh, Saudi. Um, so, the criticism of the incredible content of Ibtal Tawilat on the one hand, and the limited circulation of the book on the other hand, contributed to the obliteration of the book from the Hanbali curriculum. So accordingly, Ibtal Tawilat's attempt to sacralize Hadith al-Julus failed. No scholarship followed the book's line of argumentation, and so Hadith al-Julus failed from becoming a fundamental of the traditionalistic creed. Thank you. Please, Please questions. Thank you, Livnat, for this uh, uh, interesting talk. And uh, I would like to share some of my thoughts. And also, also I would like to thank you for uh, giving me information which uh, could help me answer a question I've been thinking on for years now. So, uh, of course, this would be a speculation, but nevertheless, uh, it uh, shows me some way. Uh, so, first of all, mm, uh, uh, I saw that Ibn Kathir refers to Al-Bukhari, but if we take Muslim, uh, we will find uh, a similar thing. Uh, Muslim, um, uh, Muslim does speak about Shafa'a, ah, when he uh, takes the issue of, uh, uh, of the Maqam Mahmud. So for Muslim Ibn Hajjaj, Maqam Mahmud is the uh, Shafa'a, ah, the Prophet's intercession, uh, but not uh, uh, any kind of sitting uh, beside God. Uh, so uh, for, for Muslim, at least, uh, uh, this was not part of his theological agenda. And uh, also Muslim, uh, interestingly and tellingly, uh, he 
uh, doesn't, uh, he doesn't cite uh, Hadith al-Julus. Uh, he doesn't include it uh, in his, uh, um, in his uh, Sahih. So uh, it is important to take into account uh, not only what he says, but also what he's silent about. So I'm wondering if uh, this hadith uh, had been on the theological agenda of the proto-Sunnis and the early members of uh, Ahl-Sunnah wal Jama'a, uh, I mean in the first half of the third century Hijrah. And uh, more importantly to me, uh, I move now uh, a century afterwards, or more than a century after Muslim, uh, and so this is uh, uh, also the lifetime of uh, Abu Ya'la. And uh, there was a very interesting Hanbali theologian, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Muhammad ibn Ishaq ibn Manda. This is not the most popular ibn Manda, who is Muhammad ibn Ishaq ibn Manda. This is his son, Abdul Rahman. Uh, Ibn Muhammad Ibn Ishaq, uh, who lived uh, between, uh, who lived uh, uh, roughly in the same period as uh, Abu Ya'la. So Abdul Rahman Ibn Muhammad was scandalous uh, even uh, among his fellow Hanbalis, and he complained that uh, his fellow Hanbalis would uh, accuse him of bid'ah and uh, anthropomorphism. Uh, so I was wondering why would they accuse him of such uh, transgressions. Uh, one of the answers was that uh, uh, it was uh, due to his uh, specific interpretation of Hadith and Nuzul. Uh, the descent of God from the throne to the lowest heaven each night, uh, because Abdul Rahman would claim that actually God vacates the throne. So God leaves the throne and goes down to the lowest heaven. But now I'm starting to think that such uh, mm, accusations of anthropomorphism may have been leveled against Abdul Rahman ibn, uh, uh, ibn Manda on account of his uh, interpretation of uh, also Hadith al-Julus. Although I'm, I'm not sure because I don't have any, um, any uh, proof, any witness, uh, but it is the same period in which Abu Ya'la was attempting to uh, canonize uh, uh, this hadith. So it is interesting that um, it led uh, to such controversy in the Hanbali, in the Hanbali uh, circles. Uh, so uh, really, <coughs> thank you for for this for this talk and uh, for the information it gave me for my own research. So thank you, Pavel. I think that I will have to think a lot about what you said, so I wrote it down. Uh, but you know, for the sake of this um, uh, of this event, um, I, w I want to say something about Hanbalis. Uh, we tend to, and I also tended to think about Hanbalis as ultra traditionalists, which is true if you think about numbers. There is, you know, the majority of the Hanbalis are such and such, but. If we see, I happen to have here a text which is taken from uh, Majmul Fatah of Ibn Taymiyyah. And in this text, Ibn Taymiyyah had a wonderful sense of, uh, he was a historian basically, and he, he really uh, analyzed the materials very accurately. So I'm not going to sing Ibn Taymiyyah's praises here because it will take me the entire afternoon, but what, what we can see here is that Ibn Taymiyyah talks about several groups of Hanbalis. And there is one group of Hanbalis who are, and he says, uh, uh, he calls them the Tamimiyun, because they were from the fa family of Tamimi, like the one who said this very nasty saying about Abu Ya'la. 
التميميون this is a family uh, who were um, um, who were very close to the Ash'aris ويميلوا إليهم في دلال أشعرية the Ash'aris were really close to them and they were taking uh, Ash'ari dogma and and they were Hanbalis I think by law but not by theology and people like Ibn al-Jawzi for example <clears throat> he can be a part of this, this group although Ibn al-Jawzi hated the, the Ash'aris but when you read Ibn al-Jawzi's theology you see that he's a rationalist um, in the same degree as, as the Ash'aris are so perhaps uh, Ibn Manda which I, I, I of course I have to, to check this Perhaps Ibn Manda was accused of anthropomorphism by this very thin layer of uh, Hanbali elite, uh, Hanbali Tamimiyun, or Hanbali Mu'tazili Hanbali, or Ash'ari Hanbali, uh, or whatever. Uh, so this is uh, what I think. Regarding uh, uh, Muslim, um, yes, Hadith al-Nuzul, uh, al -Nuzul, Hadith al-Julus, if you, if you check, there is no one single shred of this hadith in any of the canonical compilations. And I don't think that it is because uh, Bukhari had this specific theology against this hadith, maybe, maybe, or, or Muslim, or other of the authors of uh, what we call the canonical compilations. Abu Daud Sijistani was the uh, Hanbali, but um, what I wanted to say, ah, uh, yeah, I have it here. I think that uh, the case is that this hadith started circulating or in Iraq for, in a fairly late, later stage. And it was circulating in a certain circle. I'm only the beginning of, you know, analyzing these nads. But hadith mujahid, mujahid has two hadiths. One, he says, al-maqam al-mahmud al shafaa and the other, Al-Maqam Al-Mahmud, Yujlisuhu Aw Yuqaiduhu Ala Al-Arsh. And these two texts were circulating among muhaddithun with Shi'i tendencies uh, that um, were very active in Kufa. They were, di they were um, coming directly from uh, uh, disciples of Mujahid uh, to Kufa, to Basra, and afterwards to Baghdad, but they were in a very, uh, very narrow circle of uh, muhaddithun with Shia inclinations. I'm only the beginning, so I, I cannot say more than that, but I think it was dubious from the, the beginning. A muhaddith uh, from Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah couldn't accept this kind of text. How the Hanbalis uh, decided to adopt this text? Well, again, I don't have answers to that either, but thank you. Oh, that's it. <laughs> Could it uh, also be, are there any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was about to leave, you know. Thank you, Livnat. Can't hear. You say thank you for the record, uh, Kobe. <laughs> I've learned many things from your talk. I know. An important thing uh, for the rest of my life. <clears throat> I will never stand again uh, on the side of the world, yes. Okay, I have two short questions. One, uh, what you said about Mujahid and then uh, even Abbas, um, uh, whenever, whenever a, a back horse of Isnad is mentioned in this search, uh, I mean, it's not entirely clear, at least not all scholars make it entirely clear, if they mean that they have um, a certain Isnad, which was later on added one more uh, link. Uh, so my question is, uh, does the Hadith initially has an Isnad until Mujahid, and then it is the same Isnad that goes through Mujahid into Ibn Abbas, or is it uh, a different Isnad that goes down until Ibn Abbas without even uh, mentioning Mujahid, I think? Um, okay. it, it can help. Uh, Understanding what is exactly the back of this. Okay, I, I, I would like to answer before I forget uh, <laughs> what I want to say. This is fairly simple because we don't have the text in the earliest uh, record of this text is Kitab Sunnah by Al Khalal. So this is, you know, very, very late. 
And Al Khalal does not say that Ibn Abbas said this hadith, Mujahid said. Later authors added Ibn Abbas. Yes. So this is the second one. Um, uh, uh, the discussions that you've mentioned regarding the hadith, uh, it seems to be a discussion within the uh, traditionalist camp uh, in general, and not necessarily in the Hanbal. You, you have mentioned that there are many kinds of Hanbalis, uh, but I mean, for example, uh, Ibn, Ibn Kathir and Dhahabi, at least officially, they were Shafi. Of course, they were close friends of uh, yeah. uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, and, but uh, uh, how do you look at them within this camp? I mean, as okay. Shafi's. Okay, so in the Mamluk period, this is a different uh, opera. In the, when I look at this hadith, in the recording of uh, Ibn Khalal, he talks about uh, 9th century Baghdad. So it's entirely, the book is all about Hanbalis, you have no other one, a apart from the bad guys, the Mu'tazilis. Uh, one of them is called um, a Tirmidhi. Nobody knows who this Tirmidhi is. It's not the Tirmidhi from, uh, um, who compiled hadith. Somebody anonymous who attacked Hadith uh, al-Julus. In the Mamluk period, what happened is that this, this hadith, they were not entirely sure what to do with this hadith. Uh, Adahabi was not Hanbali. He, he was, on, a, on the one hand, a friend of Ibn Taymiyyah, but also an opponent of Ibn Taymiyyah. They, they had love-hate relations, you know. Uh, and, um, uh, and Ibn Kathir was, uh, his teachings really follow the line of, the Taymiyyah line. So, I think that they, they didn't know what to do with this hadith, especially because there was very aggressive attack on this text by Fakhar al-Din razi and by later uh, Ash'ari scholars. So they were on the defense. They, they, they didn't want to reject it altogether, but they didn't also want to accept, you know, the, accept it. Um, I had a question about the ijaza, which ah, I found yeah. very interesting. Um, where does it stop and where does it continue? Oh, oh. Um, yeah, the ijaza is, is fantastic. Also, I'm only at the beginning of you know exploring it. What happened is that Abu Ya'la had a son. Nobody asked me about the son. I was prepared to you know to answer questions about Ibn Abu Ya'la, the author of Tabaqat al Hanabila. So uh, he was murdered at his home. Um, I know the, you know, the Christian uh, date, not the one, uh, 100, um, no, 1,131. He was murdered at his home in Baghdad. So what Ibn Abi Ya'la did, he had a copy of the book, and somehow we see from this uh, ijaza that about 20 years after he was murdered, this ijaza started circulating uh, in, uh, in Damascus. Uh, how it arrived, why, who are the people in the ijaza, I still have to work on it. But uh, as I said, there is a huge gap of several centuries before this text surfaces again uh, in, uh, in Saudi. So. Exactly. It, I, I think that it shows why the text was, uh, why this book was had no continuance. Nobody actually taught this book, and I have a lot of questions about uh, the authenticity of this uh, manuscript. And uh, there's a lot, a lot uh, to be done about it. And uh, maybe in the next colloquium, I'll be able to, you know, present more precise answers. So thank you. Thank you, Livnat. Uh, that was a fascinating uh, presentation. My question is about Mujahid, uh, who's a Mufassir, and we have his tafsir. So uh, does his tafsir contain glosses on other anthropomorphic verses in the Quran or not? And if it does, what does he have to say about these other anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic verses? And yeah. then uh, sort of part B is uh, a generation or so later, Muqatil ibn Sulaiman is accused of anthropomorphism. So what did he 
did he have anything to say about this verse, and if so, what? Muqatil uh, had uh, nothing uh, revealing to say about this uh, verse. Actually, he was accused of anthropomorphism, that's true, but if you check the tafsir, uh, you know, systematically, Muqatil's tafsir, you see that he was not anthropomorphist at all. And the same case is about Mujahid. Mujahid had, I, I, I wouldn't say rationalistic inclinations, but that's the, that's the fact. You, he had very uh, abstract concepts of, about deity than we might think. He was not an anthropomorphist, and his tafsir does, states very clearly, Maqam Mahmoud equals Shafa. Yeah. But again, the authenticity of the tafsir and whatever, you know, that's it. <laughs> Sean, what's Just real quick, I was playing around on my computer. Uh, I, Sean, I, I, I cannot understand you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So I was playing around on my computer to see if I could find uh, something interesting. Um, and uh, I did find that there is a Shiite attestation to it in the Kitab al Ikhtisas mm -hmm. of a Sheikh al Mulfid. Well, it's not really him. He didn't really write that. Uh, we don't know who wrote it. Um, but that. But it's there. I, I can give you the, these references, and I also there's also um, Ibn Abi Khaytham's Tariq is published in a really yes, annoying yes, yes, way, yes. and yes. it's I think that's isn't that earlier than Al Khalal, and it's the traditions attested there. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. You're absolutely right. Uh, um, Ibn Abi Yala quotes these two um, texts as the most ancient sources about Hadith al-Julus in his al -Aytiqad. Yeah, wow, you are so speedy. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Can I go?